the X Prize right now, we've, uh, we've awarded about $25 million in prize money, which is just the beginning, right? It's a relatively small amount of money. The teams, as you know, it really don't do it for the money. The money, uh, you know, incentivizes, it tells the public it's important. They're doing it because it's their purpose and mission in life. The money is an excuse to a great de degree. It's a proxy for something that's important. We have about $50 million of prizes on the table right now and what we believe is about $200 million of prizes in development at different stages uh, in the pipeline. So to tell you about the active prizes and the prizes that are actually funded for development, it's my pleasure to bring my team up on stage. So why don't you guys come on up and I'll introduce you as you, uh, as you come on. So uh, first, and foremost, we have Alex Hall, who is running the Google Lunar X Prize, an amazing woman getting us back to the moon. Uh, I'll introduce uh, Mark Winter, who is running both the Qualcomm Tricorder X Prize and the Nokia Sensing X Challenge. Paul Bungie, who's running our Ocean Health, uh, soon to be Wendy Schmidt Ocean Health X Prize and our, and our ocean activities in general. Mm -hmm. And uh, you all met the amazing Eileen Bartholomew, who is spends her morning talking about deep space, or afternoons, the oceans, and in between every part of, part of the world, but uh, has one of the funnest jobs around. So, uh, you know, back when I was running the Ansari X Prize, I basically, with, uh, with my buddy Greg Marinak, I had each of, uh, I had your jobs. I had one prize I was focusing on, and, and the future of the institution lived and died based on what was going on. And what I'd like to do is ask each of the team members here to tell you about what the status of the prize is. And we're going to be very bluntly honest where things are working, where things are not working, and just share with you so that as you're designing your prizes, uh, you can learn from the experiences here. And also, uh, how you know, we have amazing captains of industry in the room here, how you might want to be involved in what they're up to. So let's begin with, uh, with Alex and the Google Lunar X Prize. Uh, you know, it was the natural follow-on to the Ansari X Prize, and we learned a lot in the process. Why don't you start, Alex, by telling us what the prize is, what the rules are, and where the status is? Sure. Thanks, Peter. So the Google Lunar X Prize uh, sounds very simple. You have to be a privately funded team to land a robot on the surface of the moon. You have to send back some high-definition images, some data, move 500 meters, and send back more images and data. But although that is the goal of the Google Lunar X Prize, a, a physical thing that teams have to accomplish, um, there's a lot more that backs up the Google Lunar X Prize about what impact doing that, what sounds like a very simple thing, will actually have. And as Peter said, this felt like the natural progression from Ansari X Prize. This was considered a good way to um, incentivize humanity to move our, our sphere of commercial influence, if you like, beyond low Earth orbit out towards the moon, out beyond Earth. And setting a goal of the moon um, was a mechanism for doing this. And also, there's another component to the Google Lunar X Prize, which is that by landing something on the moon, this is an incredibly audacious task. What we can also do is uh, create, um, as it's been described, an Apollo moment for this generation, a mechanism to capture and inspire maybe the young engineers of tomorrow, and a mechanism to connect everybody together. So although when you look at the prize, it, it, it sounds deceptively simple, it actually, if we're successful, will have a considerable impact not only on uh, the future space economy, but also on how kids view what is possible, what becomes part of their lexicon of things that they can do. Because if a privately funded team has landed on the moon, well, now I can start to dream about what opportunities, what businesses, what things I might be able to do that are not just confined to the Earth. So uh, Alex, how many teams do we have? What are their biggest challenges? Talk about that a little bit. Sure, we currently have 23 teams that are active in the competition. That's down from 30. We've been uh, more than five years into the prize. We have less than three to go. So this is kind of what we would expect for a mature prize. Reality is setting in with these teams, and they're talking about collaborating. We've had a number of mergers and acquisitions, a lot of partnerships going on, and a lot of people sharing ideas and sharing technologies. 
But one of the things that has become apparent to us as a foundation, and certainly within the Google Lunar X Prize, is that the, the deceptively simple idea of the prize, as put together back in 2007, has one or two issues in terms of when you're thinking about prize design, things perhaps you would seek maybe not to do nowadays. The, the biggest one, and the one I hear most of all, is that of those 23 teams, we have some wonderful technologies being developed to soft land on the moon, creative mobility devices, great command and control software. But unfortunately, the thing that is going to determine whether those teams get to actually use that incredible technology is whether they can fundraise enough money to, to buy their ride to the moon. And, and that is not necessarily what we wanted out of the Google Lunar X Prize. And so uh, Peter and I particularly have been working with our wonderful partners at Google to look at what can we do within the framework of the prize that will increase the likelihood of success and will hopefully make um, some of these teams that have awesome technologies but as engineers maybe aren't great marketers or fundraisers still have an opportunity to compete. Yeah, one of the things we've actually done with Google, which uh, we're extraordinarily thankful um, uh, to Larry and Sergey and to Lorraine Tuhill, uh, the CMO there, is we've, they've allowed us to modify the rules mid-prize uh, to really try and uh, front load some of the capital, give some of the team's potential uh, uh, launch assists capital-wise, and they want the prize won, right? So we're always looking at making the prize audacious enough but also achievable. To put a prize up there that no one wins, you know, uh, is, is a challenge. So it is. And, you know, one of the things to remember here is, as I was talking about this, this Apollo moment, and, and this perhaps is one of the reasons why if you're sitting in the room thinking, wow, I'd love to meet some of these, these people that are looking to go to the moon, I want you to consider this for a minute. When this, this spacecraft lands on the lunar surface, um, aside from sending back the first message that has been sent from the moon, in 40 years, and, and what are we going to say? Maybe you've got some ideas on that. Um, it's going to send back a, a little bit of data. That data will be, if you like, the first text message from the moon. About six months before launch, we'll start collecting cell phone numbers. Can you imagine if you could step back from the globe at that second, spacecraft lands, and there are people you know, in yoga poses, and their phone starts buzzing, and there are people in nightclubs, and there are people in, in villages in India all over the world. Suddenly, they're getting this message, hey, we landed on the moon. Just think for a moment about what that does to what you think about is possible. And then think about if you're one of the companies, one of the foundations, one of the folks involved with any of those teams, not just the successful ones, but the ones that are all rooting to it, how that kind of is a convening thing, how that is going to be um, just an incredible moment for, for mankind. It, sorry, what it gets is, me very excited. And, and it should. And, and by the way, uh, Alex uh, has a long history as CEO of a number of companies in the space industry. We're extraordinarily lucky to have her running this prize. Uh, Alex, what do the teams need? What could these people here potentially, if they wanted to get involved, do? Uh, what are your thoughts there? Well, as I mentioned before, we have teams developing uh, really interesting technologies, and one of the um, areas that a lot of teams are struggling in is really finding the partners that will help them get to the moon, whether that's by working with a team to help them craft and market their story in a way that um, will attract the necessary funding, um, or whether it's people with, with technology um, that can also help the teams. It, really, it's, it's getting these guys to the moon is our... Is our, our, our challenge right now. So if you want to put your corporate logo or your national flag on one of these teams, <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I'm sure that they would want to. And, and the fact oh. of the matter is, uh, it will happen, right? The, these teams, uh, one of these teams will pull it off. And when they do, uh, they will do it orders of magnitude cheaper. I don't know if, I know Lori Garver uh, arrived. Lori, are you in the room here? Uh, not yet. She's probably checking in. But uh, Lori's the deputy administrator of NASA. You'll be hearing her tomorrow morning. NASA put up what? Uh, talk about that a little bit. Sure. So uh, for our American teams, um, NASA actually put up an equivalent prize purse. The Google Lunar X Prize is $30 million. And NASA put up a, a purse of $30 million, which they could award in contracts to purchase um, data and technology Ooh. from our American teams. There's a competitive process for this. And we had about half a dozen teams qualified. And so as they are moving along in their different stages, they're able to um, access uh, cash from NASA uh, that is buying 
what they have dis developed, what they've discovered, what data they've generated at this particular phase of their, of their development. Um, we've obviously been working very hard to try and, and find similar uh, mechanisms for some of our global teams, um, but there are other opportunities available to some of the global teams, for example, um, that don't have, in, if they're in a country that doesn't have such a big track record in space, then they're able to play the, the nationalistic card. They're able to say, we want to get something from XYZ country on the moon, and that is their kind of fundraising token. So, you know, it's, it's very interesting how the different motivations of the teams lead, lead to different ways in which they can access funds. Last question, this prize has a deadline, what is that? It is December 31st, 2015, and I personally think we're going to get two launches. Two launches. You heard it here today. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Alex. Awesome. We'll come back to you in, in Q&A. Mark Winter, you are in the middle of an amazing set of two prizes that are going to revolutionize global health. So let's start. Um, let's talk. Uh, first of all, I want to mention we have two amazing people in the room here who made this possible. I had a, uh, a fateful lunch with uh, Paul Jacobs. Paul, where are you? You're over there, the, the chairman, CEO of Qualcomm and also the Qualcomm Foundation. Over lunch, we talked about you know, the tricorder and, uh, and uh, uh, Paul shook hands, literally at lunch, hey, let's do this, and we were off to the races announcing it at CES. And then uh, the sister prize that we're talking about in a moment is the Nokia Ascension Challenge. I called my good friend Henry Thierry, and on the phone with Eileen, he said, let's do this, and we have two amazing prizes. So let's talk about this. Tell us about the Qualcomm Tricorder first. Well, the, the Tricorder prize is extraordinary. It's a real game changer. The concept is a handheld device. We don't specify whether it's an Android device or an iOS device. It could be a custom embedded device. But under five pounds, with an array of biosensors that can detect up to 15 different health uh, states and conditions, uh, in a consumer device, this is an important concept to understand, its focus is on consumer use, not clinical use. So the level of user interface design and user experience design is a critical part of it. Another critical facet of the tricorder is its communications ability, not only low power communications to hopefully wireless sensors and other devices primarily, but also to be able to communicate through the cloud to other kinds of systems that may inform the device. So you may have analytical databases where basic data is captured about the user and then communicated to a system that does analytics on the back end and returns certain codes and information to the device to inform the consumer in a friendly way. Or the device itself may have the smarts embedded in it to actually do a lot of that work or some combination. We also require it to be able to record information to an electronic health record. And I think the real significance of this competition, the real game-changing aspect of this, is we're really talking about a personal portal that not only can capture rich information about your ongoing health status, but be able to communicate that effectively to your healthcare provider as well. We've all heard about the crises in the healthcare system, the inability to reach doctors, the challenge of doctors to provide enough information uh, to their patients, or be able to even communicate with them on a regular basis. And the promise of the tricorder is to really facilitate and enable that. And I think that's one of the most exciting aspects of this, uh, of this competition. Mark, how many teams uh, have pre-registered so far? We have 287 teams from 35 countries that have currently pre-registered for the competition. We, pretty amazing, huh? Absolutely. Extraordinary yeah. response from around the world. Yeah. I mean, it's, I, I get a monthly report uh, from, uh, from Mark and his team, and I'm like looking at the, na the global distribution of teams. Uh, it, and it blows me away. Um, Mark, uh, talk about what you have to do to win in this prize. Yes. Well, there's several key aspects to it. Um, it's not as simple as delivering, for example, the beauty and elegance of the Ansari X Prize was being able to meet fairly definitive metrics. This is a little more complex because, first of all, we're determining whether or not the device can actually properly identify 15 specific disease states, actually 12 that are mandatory and three that are elective that the teams have to select. It also needs to be able to monitor in real time and report in real time the key vital signs, things like oxygenation and body temperature, pulse, and so forth, and be able to carry that information back to an electronic health record system. So one of the, uh, you know, those are challenging requirements, and I think one of the exciting aspects of this is all the materials technology. In fact, Jack Andraka, who is one of our teams, spoke about this. Extraordinary convergence of new materials technologies at the same time, we're seeing an enormous amount of research and development in new medical science and evidence 
that are converging together with this remarkable environment of wireless technology. And that's really sort of the rich soil that this competition is built on top of and why we're going to see extraordinary results from this competition. So the sister competition is the, uh, the Nokia Sensing uh, X Challenge. And I, I love this imagery and this, this uh, campaign. Talk about Nokia Sensing and, and what, uh, what the mission and vision is. Um, I'm also very excited about the, the Nokia competition. Um, first of all, <clears throat> in my view, and the view of many people that follow the mobile health space, a precursor technology set to really evolving these handsets that can communicate to con consumers and to physicians is the sensor array. I mean, we have this enormous range of clinical conditions that we would need to address ultimately with these devices. And our vision is that we'd have plug and play communications capability between biosensors, area sensors, even in, uh, environmental sensors of various kinds that would be able to quickly communicate with this handheld device, but very specific to the personalized care needs of individuals. So the purpose of the Nokia competition is to really proliferate all the creative potential of biosensors, area sensors, and also a unique category, data sensors, that actually use analytical tools to look at your own personal health record along with public health data and predict possible disease. Those are the three kind of major conceptual categories. So um, I think that this is a very important competition because it is a precursor, really a precursor to the emergence of the larger mobile health marketplace as we view it. Uh, number of teams and the format of this competition, if you could. Sure. We uh, actually pre-registered uh, 127 uh, teams in total for the competition. And in this, we broke it down into two challenges. We have challenge one and challenge two. It's a little bit different than the Qualcomm prize. Uh, the current one just closed. Uh, we have registration that's fully closed now on the first challenge. And we have 33 teams that are competing for that one. And that will be uh, culminated roughly in around September of, of, of uh, the end of this year. Uh, that will result in another challenge starting up at that time. We'll have an award ceremony at that point in time, and we have registration starting up fairly shortly for the second challenge. So, in essence, the, I mean, a lot of the Nokia sensing ch uh, uh, sensors coming out of that are going to potentially flow into the Qualcomm teams as well, right? We're trying to create an ecosystem here, a marketplace, if you would. Yes, Peter said it well, is that they really are sister uh, uh, and companion competitions in a way. And we are going to do everything we can to facilitate communications and joint efforts between the teams that develop the sensors and the teams that are working actively on the tricorder. And we're blessed with the fact that we have actually teams that are working on both, which is terrific. And we built a remarkable, and this is something new for the foundation, a rather remarkable platform we call Marketplace that enables not only teams to find each other and communicate, but we're also building an entire ecosystem of resources for those teams with technologies, telecommunications capabilities, other features that they can use to help accelerate their development of their projects. Uh, so, yeah. uh, last question, if I could. When the Ansari X Prize got, uh, actually got to the winning point, it really drove the FAA to mm. change the rules and regulations. This must be driving the FDA as well. Talk about that. We are really lucky to have tremendous support within the Food and Drug Administration, and that goes back to the very inception of the prize. Um, and we have uh, started and are coming close to completing a series of major discussions with the FDA that would provide resources and support as well for teams that are going through the, the competition for the tricorder. Um, it's notable that we ourselves do not require FDA approval. We're trying to prove the concept of a 1.0 device but we fully expect that most teams will want to commercialize their devices, and we're trying to create an easy entry into the marketplace in every respect that would include regulatory support, it would include support by healthcare systems and also insurers who are aware of the project, and also, most importantly, also investors who are interested in supporting this initiative. It was exciting to see and hear Mike Lazaridis, who is one of the founders of RIM, recently announced a $100 million fund to specifically fund a tricorder device, a medical tricorder. And uh, I think it's that kind of excitement and energy in this market that is going to help all these teams commercialize their solutions and bring them to consumers very soon. Perfect. All right, uh, our next subject, uh, oceans. You may remember I mentioned Wendy Schmidt had funded uh, the, in response to the BP oil spill and oil cleanup competition, which really drove tremendous breakthrough, literally six-fold increase on oil spill cleanup. She had an amazing experience on the heels of that. She said, I've had, you know, this is the best philanthropic experience I've had. I'd like to do another prize. 
And uh, she said, what do you have in oceans? We took to her what is now being called the Wendy Schmidt Ocean Health X Prize. Paul, take it away. Tell us what is it and so, what's your vision? Uh, th this is, uh, we're all excited, right? We love this. And this is actually, I think, probably the best place to talk about this because we've got a view of the oceans out, 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 the, uh, out the window here. Um, but the oceans are, are frankly in quite a bit of trouble. And, and there's a host of challenges that you've probably heard about. But recall that when you look at the waves that are out there, what's underneath the surface of the ocean is a delicate balance upon which 90%, 90% of all the habitable space on Earth, all the habitat for creatures, is under the underwater. And it requires the chemistry and the ecosystems to be, to be just so for different organisms to survive. Well, there's sort of a dark side uh, to what, the, what, what humans have been doing in emitting greenhouse gases. When carbon dioxide goes up into the air, it also gets absorbed, about a quarter of it gets absorbed directly by the oceans. And anybody that knows the difference between a flat soda and a soda that's still sparkling knows that when carbon dioxide gets into water, it forms carbonic acid and causes the pH to drop. This is what scientists call ocean acidification. Uh, that is a real problem because organisms that need things like calcium carbonate, carbonate again, to build their shells are in trouble. And there are places on, on the planet now where you're seeing things like oysters, you're seeing things like, like the phytoplankton at the base of the food chain, uh, you're seeing things like corals die off as a result of how hard it is for them to start making their, their shells out of the calcium carbonate that, that should be dissolved in the water or, or should be able to precipitate out of the water. But because of these fossil fuel emissions, because of the CO2, it's changing. Well, so we know that much. Scientists have been basically ringing an alarm bell for only about five years around ocean acidification largely based on models saying if there's so much CO2 in the air, it's got to get into the water. We know how this works. And a few scientists went out with a few very expensive sensors, measured a couple spots in the ocean, and said, yep, it's happening. Gosh, this is going to be a problem. But we don't know anything more than that. We frankly don't have the tools to measure what's happening under the waves. This is an area where there's, we talked about market failures earlier today, there's just basically no investment in measuring ocean chemistry. So the Wendy Schmidt Ocean Health X Prize is solving that problem, recognizing that we can't even begin to get a handle on something like ocean acidification until we can measure it. How do you solve what you can't measure? We start with that. We emphasize a breakthrough pH sensor. Quite straightforward, quite simple. Something that is an order of magnitude more accurate than, than, than anything that exists today, and several orders of magnitude cheaper and easier to use so that you don't need a PhD in 30 years in ocean chemistry and, uh, and a $40,000 a day research budget for a vessel to go out there and measure these things. So that the manager of a protected area along the coast can stick in, in Cameroon can stick this in the water and know if there's a problem. So that commercial fisheries, the, the hatcheries in Oregon and Washington that are providing uh, over two thirds of the oysters and, and, and clams and scallops that we eat in the US, so that they have the ability to know whether or not their larvae, the, the little baby, baby mollusks are going to be able to develop. Once that happens, we'll have the platform and the ability to start building awareness globally, to start changing policies like, like, like Peter was talking about, and to start shifting the marketplace. And this is, this is kind of a place where we're, we're, we're launching this later this year. So we're, we're right in the throes of prize development. So I know what you guys did all, all day today is hard work. I, I, I know. Trust me. This isn't easy. It's not supposed to be easy. Solving the world's grand challenges is hard work. But when you get that nut of a prize, you get that fine point of the spear, like a pH sensor that can affect our ability to understand ocean acidification, it can have all these other odds on impacts. And this is a place where, where hopefully some of you can start to engage. Because what we're talking about are things like needing teams to get at this. There are, right now, there are only six companies on Earth that make pH sensors for the oceans. Only six, only two that do it commercially. And they're terrible. They don't measure things accurately. They're incredibly expensive. They take several weeks to calibrate. They take several months to understand what the data that comes out of them means. Useless from a perspective of trying to get a handle on a challenge that's going to destroy the oceans in the next couple of decades if we don't do something about it. That fine point of the spear means we need teams that are coming from the medical field, where we've got incredibly accurate pH sensing for intravenous measurements, from other industries, and from, frankly, from inventors that, you know, like, like we heard Jack this morning, you know, people that can say, I got a better way to measure pH. The chemistry is not that crazy. We need those teams to come out of the woodwork. The other thing we need is we, we need to build an ecosystem for change. We need to build a market where none exists. What we're talking about providing is data about ocean chemistry on an unprecedented scale 
But that's only one piece of, of data that we, we can have associated with the oceans. And in fact, if you, if you think about building an industry around the oceans, we're starting to talk about tens of billions of, of dollars potential revenue just on information and data that comes out of this. Think about it, what we call ocean services. Think about weather services. Think about what, where we were 20 years ago when there was no AccuWeather or Weather Channel, when the entire scope of weather services was a several hundred million dollar NOAA budget and nothing else. Today, it's about a $10 billion a year annual, annual industry globally in weather services. Given the hundreds of billions of dollars that, that, that uh, come out of extracting things from the oceans, fishing from the oceans, tourism in the oceans, trade across the seas, there is a market for this kind of data. And we, we intend to prove the point with the Wendy Schmidt Ocean Health X Prize that when you start to build simple metrics, you can drive the growth of markets, the growth of public awareness. You can start to get momentum for change that really never lets up. You're not passionate about this Oh, at I'm all. sorry. I like... This is why I love this spot. We picked a place with a view of the ocean. Yeah. Um, so uh, talk one second about what follows this, which is your Go Deeper campaign. Th thanks, Peter, for doing that. This is the other thing that anybody that wants to help, please come up here. I'm going to come hat in hand for doing this. This is the second ocean prize, right? This is a place where we know we care about this. And as you guys are seeing, these wicked problems, these really difficult grand challenges, require you to build momentum for change. And that means solving pieces of the puzzle and continuing on doing that. And we've realized at XPRIZE, what we need to do is, is way more than build a network around a particular prize, build all of these investments. We need to do what's happening with Google Lunar, for instance. And really, what we, in this case, we need to go deeper. This is what we're calling our initiative around education and engagement so that we can engage a network of partners, so that we can engage educators in aquariums around the world, in schools around the world, so that we can engage the public in, a massive, in massive outreach efforts, uh, to think about how they can start solving some of their individual problems and building momentum for change using the fact that a prize tells people solutions really are possible. They really are possible. They're difficult, but we're in this for the long haul. And what we see is 10 years from now, we've done a series of oceans prizes. What we see is a world where the oceans are not, no, longer, uh, no longer dying and really you know, a blank canvas because we don't know what's going on out there. What we see is a place where the oceans are healthy, they're, they're valued, there's monetary value coming from them, ocean services, they're valued in a way personally that isn't, isn't precedented today. And number three, they're understood, because we start by measuring these kinds of things and you can really drive the rest of the change in all of those. And so if anybody out there is passionate, like, like I am obviously, about the oceans, we're, we're, we're building now a small network, a, a consortium of funding partners and others around Go Deeper to really, really change the world, frankly, with, with respect to oceans. Come talk to me, I'd, I'd, love to, I'd, love to, I'd love to have your help. Thank you, Paul. So our active prize, ladies and gentlemen, we'll have some time for Q&A at the close. But I would like to uh, ask Eileen and pass the torch here. Uh, what's in design right now? What are we going to be launching over the next uh, 12 months? Sure. So as you all know, designing prizes aren't easy. You end up getting deeper and deeper, and things become more complicated. And each of these active prizes has done a tremendous job in taking a difficult challenge and identifying a clear, measurable target. And what we're trying to do in prize development is do the same, but across a number of different places. One that we're most excited about is a, a Global Literacy X Prize. We're hoping to launch this sometime in the end of this year. You know, we all know about the literacy problem. 800 million people across the globe don't know how to read and write, and we think that's, and we can't hire enough teachers, train enough teachers, and build enough schools to help address that. So we need to come up with a different way to solve that problem, and that may be something that is both scalable and doesn't rely on the kind of infrastructure and resources that we traditionally think of through schools and teachers. So our goal in this competition is to bring a group of students up to some level of literacy, perhaps uh, basic reading and writing and decoding, allowing us to showcase that this can be done quickly and without the kind of infrastructure requirements we think of in this space. I'm pretty excited about that. I, I wanted to say, uh, the work we're doing in global literacy right now came out of the support of a small group of individuals who uh, contributed part of our spirit of innovation. If you're a member of the SOI for Education Learning, could I ask you guys to stand up one second, if you're here, please? So I know Cheryl and Frank, thank you very much. Uh, you guys rock. So it's a, it's a group of eight individuals who gave us the seed money. What I can tell you is that seed money is going to fund us to launch a series of two or three tens of million dollar level campaigns that will then drive hopefully hundreds of millions and billions of dollars of, mm -hmm. of team expenditures and investments. It's all about leverage, right? Our goal, if you're gonna be spending money philanthropically, 
Our goal is simply to help you do it more efficiently and more highly leveraged, period. Totally. Thanks, Sorry, Peter. I get passionate about this. <laughs> Love it. Here. We're also looking at battery technologies. We all know that a lot can be improved here. We've seen a lot of government announcements about investing in this, but not a lot has changed. And we think it's time that we improve battery technology, for, for example, for electric vehicles. Not only the density of that battery, but the issues around how batteries take a charge, how fast it, how long it takes for them to do so, and how many times it can be done. We want to eventually create an industry where everybody can drive an electric vehicle and not worry about how far it can go and how long it takes to make it happen. But we also know that we don't just want to stop there. Um, we're, we're working with uh, Florida Power and Light and, of course, their parent company, Next Era Energy, on that battery challenge. But we're also working with Larry Page on a re what we call a revolutionary battery challenge, where we bring up the performance of battery technology, not just one or twofold, but 500 or 600 percent improvement. So we start seeing types of battery technologies that can enable applications like electric aviation and electric flight. Pretty exciting. But we're also looking in the medical field. Um, with the success of the Qualcomm Tricorder X Prize and the work for the Nokia Sensing X Challenge, we think there's a lot of work to be done, particularly in data and analytics around health and health information. You know, right now, they, the, the poets say that the eye is a window to the soul. But the eye is also a window to a lot of other things, including your health state and health conditions. So we believe that by looking at images of the eye, you can diagnose diseases like diabetic retinopathy, heart disease, potentially other vision and, and vision in uh, loss of, of, of vision diseases. And we think that by impair, in group, empowering a group of small teams to actually go and develop the kinds of algorithms it takes to understand what those images mean, we don't have to rely on just an ophthalmologist's office to make it happen and get that diagnosis and ultimately treat people. And something that we're also really excited about, and for those of you that were in the aging session today, you know about the implications of the Alzheimer's wave that's going to hit us. We uh, think that a prize needs to happen in this field. We're just at the early stages of launching a prize fund underwritten by a number of, of philanthropists, including Frank Sullivan, who's here in the room, and Ken Dykewald, thank you so much. Um, and we're trying to find a way to make this problem go away. Well, just, to be, just to be clear, what we've done is we've raised the seed capital to do the design work. We haven't mm -hmm. started any design yet. So if you're in the aging area and you come up with some good ideas, that will give us the foundations to start. Once we have a design, we will then go out to find our and sponsor find or sponsors for it. Absolutely. A lot of great ideas that emerge from that session. And then lastly, but certainly not least, uh, we're partnering with the Roddenberry Foundation to launch something we're calling the Transporter X Prize. I don't know how many of you came down on the 405 or perhaps late at night when the 405 was closed, but imagine a time where you don't have to worry about highways and byways to get places. You have your own personal portation device that you can get into and go from point A to point B without a lot of, of, of hassle or fuss. And I just think also the, the name of this prize is so cool. Yeah, the Roddenberry, the Roddenberry Transporter, Transporter I mean, X Prize. No, we, got the, we got the tricorder, the transporter. You can probably guess what's next. <laughs> Absolutely. But I'd like to say all of these prizes are in their early stages. They're a glimmer in our eye. We're going through the kinds of, of thoughts and conversations that you've been and will experience tomorrow. And so if you're interested in getting involved in helping us think through the challenges of any of these categories, we've got upcoming visioneering meetings, prize development activities, phone conversations with folks like you that care and have passion and have knowledge around this topic. So we'd love to get you involved in the work that we do. Thank you, Eileen. Awesome. A round of applause for our, uh, our prize <laughs> leaders.